night was posed by Tony Palmer. Tony Palmer. He is a bishop, and um, he posed this question in an evangelical uh, Pentecostal uh, leaders' conference uh, way back in January 2014. He asked them the question, is the protest over? And we are asking our, ourselves this question every night. So the question is, tonight, once more, will you be a protester? You need to answer that for yourself. Now, once more, uh, definition of a protestant. One of the parties of princes who adhered to Luther at the Reformation in 1529. Also, a protest, protestant is a, a party to the declaration of dissent from a decree of Charles V at the Diet of Speyer. Protestant is um, a name that was afterwards, in later years, given to the followers of Calvinism. Protestants is the denomination now given, is the name given to all who belong to the Reformed churches. Right, as always, we are posed with a question every night of what we are called to do, what is our duty, in these last days of earth history. The words of Mordecai to Esther the queen, um, his cousin, the daughter of his uncle. Mordecai says these words. Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mm. Amen? Mm. You know, this um, text is very relevant to me because I asked myself, in these days, when I was very happy in the Methodist church, how come I am here in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination? Mm. For who knows? whether I have been called to this place for such a time as this. Amen? Amen? So we pose this question to everybody. Today's topic. Tonight we are looking at the oppression and the persecution. It is always directed at Jesus Christ and his followers. Specifically, we are going to look at Jerusalem. What horrors of uh, oppression and persecution came upon Jerusalem. Amen? Let's pray. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Persecution and oppression always comes at uh, Jesus Christ followers. Right from those early days. Look at the Bible text. 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Next, Matthew 5, 10. You read that, please. Amen. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. John 15, 18. And the last one, Luke 6, 22. For the Son of Man's sake. Words of Jesus right in those early days, in the beginning of um, of the Christian church, he was telling us, and now we know from his words that persecution will come to God's people. Persecution and oppression. Amen? Amen? So we go to the early centuries. In the first centuries, 
When Jesus revealed to his disciples the fate of Jerusalem and the scenes of a second advent still ahead of us, he foretold also the experience of his people from the time when he should be taken from them to his return in power and glory for their deliverance. From Olivet, the Savior beheld the storms um, about to fall upon the apostolic church and penetrating deeper into the future. His eye discerned the fields, wasting campus that would beat upon his followers in the coming ages of darkness and persecution. Amen? Amen. So are we looking back in those times of darkness? Amen. The ages of darkness that Jesus was talking about? In his days, he was looking forward through, into and through those dark days and dark ages. Today, we look back through the dark ages into Jesus Christ when he was alive on this earth and the words he spoke. In the first centuries, continuing, in a few brief utterances of awful significance, he foretold the portion which the rulers of this world would met out to the church of God. Matthew 24, 9, 21, and 22. The followers of Christ must tread the same path of humiliation, reproach, and suffering which their master trod. The enmity that burst forth against the world's redeemer would be manifested against all who should believe on his name. Amen? Amen. All includes you and me today. How many of us are suffering oppression and persecution now? Not yet? Wait for it. It will surely come. History testifies to Jesus' words. Um, Tertullian was a historian um, in the early church. The persecutions against Christians began under the Roman Emperor Nero, about July AD 64, we've learned that, and continued intermittently for centuries. It was the Christian writer, Tertullian, in 197 to 277 AD, who in 206 AD wrote to the Emperor Septimus Severus that the blood of Christians is sealed. Have we read that before? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have. In April 311 AD, the Roman persecutions against Christians suddenly ceased. As Constantine the First, with his associates, issued an edict of toleration. Now that the church has become popular in scriptural errors from paganism, immediately began crowding into the church. We've gone through that, right? This is like a, rep uh, a revision. It's a repetition and a revision. <clears throat> Continuing into history that proves Jesus' words. Uh, the edict of toleration is the same as the edict of Milan. During constant reign, the church became the official religion of the empire. Persecution of Bible-believing Christians by half-converted pagan church leaders now began and continued on for centuries. Okay? Is persecution new? It's not new. Something is new. What is new? The persecution the person persecuting. The person persecuting. In the past, who was persecuting? The government. Now, who is persecuting? Church leaders. Half converted church leaders. Let's move on to the uh, actual horror and uh, persecutions that came upon the Jewish people. After the death of Christ, the Jews became more and more intransigent and rebellious. In August AD 66, when Florus, the Roman procurator, procurator of Judea, made several mistakes in his governance, the Jews appealed to Agrippa. You remember King Agrippa? He was the one that called Paul, and Paul gave him a sermon. He almost uh, received Christ as his savior in those days. But uh, King Agrippa told them, forget it. That's a simple matter. You sort it out yourself. 
The Jews were angry. Anger, they threw stones at Agrippa. And he left the city. And for the next four years, Jerusalem was to know no peace. This is leading up to a great, terrible uh, event of the destruction of Jerusalem. First, the fall of Jerusalem. Some of the Jews uh, seized parts of Jerusalem. They want to control the city. And fighting broke out <coughs> among them. So they started to break away into divisions and sections with their own leaders, among themselves. The Roman garrison of soldiers in the fortress Antonia next to the temple were completely slaughtered. Ananias the priest, the high priest, and his brother, who are descendants of Anas, who condemned Christ, were slain by Jewish factions, who then turned upon one another. So here we have a civil war inside Jerusalem. We can say that's the beginning of the fall of Jerusalem. The Judean procurator slays Jews. Who is this man? His name is Florus. Retaliating, Florus slew 20,000 Jews in Caesarea. Jews then attacked the cities throughout Judea, slaying Romans. Finally, the dilatory Cestius Gaius, legate of Syria, decided to do something. Heading south with 30,000 troops, he burned Joppa and then surrounded Jerusalem. Just as the Jewish moderates were about to hand over the city to him, he unexpectedly withdrew. Who's withdrawing? The legate of Syria. Amen? What's his name? Cestius. Cestius. This surprise retreat gave the Jews a strength of heart. And they determined to resist the Romans. The Jews immediately left the city and set off in close pursuit. They left the city and went after Cestius and the Roman soldiers. Cestius and the Roman soldiers had come to surround the city. Before taking over the city, they withdrew. Amen? Okay. We know that it's confirmed in uh, biblical uh, scriptures that um, the withdrawal will provide the window for escape. For the Christian. Going on, Cestius and Agrippa flee Jerusalem. At a battle near Beth Horon, Cestius only succeeded in making good his escape to Antioch by sacrificing much equipment. All his siege engines, all his, um, his um, military equipment, he had to jettison and discard, leaving them behind. But the greater part of his army, nearly 6,000 <coughs> soldiers. <coughs> Running and singing, the Jews returned to Jerusalem and <coughs> with terrible faith. Jews think they have, they have uh, triumphed, they are victorious, so they returned happy to Jerusalem. They didn't know the terrible fate awaiting them inside that city in the very near future. It was the end of October, AD 67. It was at this time that the pro-Roman king Agrippa, number two, and his sister Bernice, they fled the city of Jerusalem and went to Galilee, where they later joined the Romans, meaning Cestius, and about six months later, returned to Rome. Um, Gaius, Cestius Gaius, died in Christians flee the city. As, as we said before, there was a window provided. A window allows Christians in the city of Jerusalem to run away. It was significant that when Christ foretold his coming suffering and destruction, he carefully warned his followers <coughs> that they must continue as usual to observe the Sabbath day Sabbath. That's, that's uh, mentioned in uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse he told them, what did he say? To flee, but to pray that the, the flight is not on, the Sabbath is not on the winter. So this they did, they flew, they 
they fled Jerusalem when Cestius withdrew from the city in October AD 67. Heading east, they crossed the Jordan River and found refuge in the town of Tel. Christians from Jerusalem in AD 67 went straight to the town of Tel. That was their refuge. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, what is Rome going to do? Emperor Nero sends the best. Because the revolt that is taking place in Judea must be controlled and suppressed. Soon after this, in February AD 68, Emperor Nero appointed his best general, Vespasian, to put down the rebellion. He immediately went to the region with the 5th and the 10th legions. Two legions he took with him and was later joined by his son, Titus, at this place, Ptolemais, who brought with him the 15th legion. How many legions are heading towards Jerusalem? Three legions altogether. With a strength of 60,000 professional soldiers, the Romans prepared to sweep across Galilee and march upon Jerusalem. Heading south towards Jerusalem, he quickly took Jodapata, Joppa again, and all of Galilee, and sold 30,000 Jews into slavery. At Jordan, he slew 15,000 Jews the history of the war was covered in detail by a Roman Jewish historian called Josephus in his work, The Wars of the Jews. So the detail of this war that we are going to hear tonight and the fall of Jerusalem, the details come from the writings of Josephus. Amen? Amen. <coughs> Who was Josephus? Josephus was a leading Jew. He had served as commander at the city of Jotapata. When the Roman army invaded Galilee in AD 67, after exhausting an, an exhausting siege which lasted 47 days, the city fell with an estimated 40,000 killed. All the remaining Jews, uh, Jewish resistance committed suicide, except who was left? Josephus and one of his soldiers. They surrendered to Vespasian. Immediately upon meeting Vespasian, Josephus dramatically predicted that he would soon become Roman emperor. What an announcement, eh? Startled by this and finding Josephus totally willing to cooperate, instead of killing him, Vespasian used Josephus to provide with him, the uh, provide the Romans with intelligence about the, the land of Judea and the ongoing re revolt. Amen? Intricate politics, eh? The onslaught to Jerusalem, the onslaught. Now Je Je Jehoshaphat is, uh, is with Vespasian. He told Vespas Vespasian, you will be the future Roman emperor. That, that startled Vespasian. Who is Vespasian's son? Another general. Titus. His name is Titus. They are joined together now for the onslaught of uh, Judea, especially Jerusalem. And they have three legions all together with them. Two with the father and one with the son. By AD 68, the entire coast and the north Judea had been subjugated. And Titus had distinguished himself as a skilled general. Meanwhile, the thousands of Jews in Jerusalem had become embroiled in civil conflict, dividing the resistance against the Romans in the city into several factions, which were ultimately reduced to two factions. So in Jerusalem, from many factions to only two. So two leaders, two groups, two leaders inside the city. What were the name of the leaders? The Sikari led by Simon Bar Giora and the Zealots led by John Gishkala. By this time, all Judea except Jerusalem was under the control of Titus, the son. Titus is the son. He's got one legion, the 15th legion. 
Vespasian's 30-year-old son, who was now general of the combined Roman army. Vespasian himself, on returning to Rome, had become the emperor. Little, uh, little details and uh, intricacies of uh, politics in the Roman Empire led the father to go back to Rome, leaving the son behind in control of the whole operation. Eventually, the father, on his return to Rome, became emperor. When he was emperor in Rome, the son continued to, with the assault upon Jerusalem. On May 10, AD 70, with 65,000 men, Titus arrived at the gates of Jerusalem. Every type of horror was experienced within the walls. And this would continue until Titus gained control 100 and 39 days later. All the horrors in Jerusalem, long predicted in the Bible, were now being fulfilled. Praise the Lord. History and scriptures coming together, right? It has always been proven by those that care to check that the Bible is the best history book of the ages. Well, when Titus arrived at the gates of Jerusalem, there was horror inside the gates of Jerusalem. Unimaginable horror. We've read about these horrors in the Bible many times, but it's happening now. And will continue for how many days? 139 days. Let's continue. Check out the horrors. Horrors within the walls of Jerusalem. Deuteronomy 28, 52 to 55. You've read them before? Read it again tonight. Amen? 2, 3. And then he shall be Tonight, can you put a name to the he? And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates. Who's he? Titus. 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 Praise the Lord. Let's continue reading. Horrors between, um, you know, within the walls of Jerusalem. 28 is still within verses 52 to 55. 2, 3. His eyes shall be evil toward his brother, and toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the remnant of his children, which he shall leave, so that he will not give to any of them the flesh of his children, whom he shall eat, because he hath nothing left in the siege, and in the strictness wherein thine enemies shall distress thee in all thy gates. In the, in the siege and in the strictness how many days siege and how many days straightness? 139 days. Siege and straightness. That means hardship. Continue. Deuteronomy 28, 56 and 57. 2, 3. The tender and delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eye shall be evil towards her husband, her bosom, and towards her son, and towards her daughter, and towards her young ones that cometh out from between her feet, and towards her children which she shall eat, shall bear. All things secretly in the siege and straightness, wherein thy enemies shall distress thee in thy gates. Amazing prophecy, eh? Is it happening now? It is happening. It's coming to fulfillment within the period of 139 days. Now this Roman army has surrounded the city to besiege it. Titus now prepared for an assault on Jerusalem. The Roman army was joined by the 12th legion, which had been previously defeated four years later under Cestius. Cestius has died in uh, Rome. The Roman army which is the 15th and the 12th legions, under Titus arrived from Mount Scopus near Bethesda, Beth, Bethsaida, where Lazarus, Mary, and Martha lived. 
in the northwest, they encountered Jewish forces at the Lumen Gate, the Lumen Gate on the north side of Jerusalem. Then they established their main camp outside the city on the west, as the 5th Legion came from Emmaus to the west. The 10th Legion arrived from Jericho to the east, surrounding the city. Amen? Titus surrounds the city. Titus then surrounded the city with three legions, 5th, 12th, and 15th, on the western side, and one, the 10th, on the Mount of Olives, to the east. He put pressure on the food and water supplies of the inhabitants by allowing pilgrims to enter. What were the pilgrims coming to, to do? Pilgrims from all over the country coming into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Passover, the feast of the Passover. But once they go in, Titus refuses to let them come out again. So the number in the city increases and it puts pressure upon food supply water supply. However, Jewish raids continue to harass the Roman army. Josephus pleads with the Jews on the wall. Titus decided to have Josephus plead with the men on the wall to surrender the city in order to save themselves and the city. But they only hurled darts at their last human mediator. Their sudden surprise response wounded Josephus and narrowly missing, killing Titus, who was standing by his side. Josephus stood behind a barrier and shouting, plead some more with them, but to no avail. Why is Josephus doing this? He's telling the Jews on the wall, please surrender. Give yourselves up, save yourself, and save the city, and especially the temple. Save the temple. The Jews don't want to listen. And we know why. We've read it many times before in, um, in our previous studies. The reason they don't want to surrender is because of false prophets. False prophets tell them, God is your leader. He will save them. This is our temple. It will never fall. False prophets, eh? In those days, there are false prophets in today, in these days as well. Amen. Breakthrough in the war. At last they had the breakthrough. Now the Romans quickly resumed hostilities and breached the first and the second walls of the city. To intimidate resistance, Titus ordered that all deserters from the Jewish side be crucified around the city wall. By this time, most of the Jews were thoroughly exhausted because the few have been stealing their food. And when the weak third wall was breached, bitter street fighting ensued. So, Uh, we read here that uh, all those who tried to escape from the city or tried to leave to find food and come back inside, they tried to do this at night. When they are caught, they are crucified on crosses. They're killed on crosses. We've read um, in, um, in uh, history books that the crosses that uh, were, were raised up outside the walls of Jerusalem were so close together, you couldn't walk between them. The Roman war, war engines were in use. Remember, Cestius had to throw away his war engine, and Titus came, it came with more war engines. Then three legions broke through the outer wall and took the northern part of Jerusalem and the fortress Antonia, which was next to the Temple Mount. A siege Siege dike was laid around the still unconquered parts of the city, so no Jews could secretly escape. The fortress Antonia, the temple wall, were breached with the help of battering rams, banks, 75 foot towers, and hurling machines. The Romans had taken the fortress Antonia by the end of July. From the temple area, as a breach was made in the southwestern wall, two breaks were made in the inner city wall. The southern upper city near the temple mount was overrun and taken. Final push into Jerusalem. He then began a frontal assault. Who is this? The 
the general of Paul Titus. Eh? Having broken through them, Titus entered the edifice and found it to be so gorgeous that he ordered it not to be destroyed. He looked inside the temple. It was so wonderfully built and uh, so rich and precious. He ordered it not to be destroyed. But while the fighting around the gates continued, an unperceived soldier hurled a torch inside a main door and quickly set the entire building ablaze. The date was August AD 70. Exactly as was reported in prophecy. Three more weeks and all Jerusalem was burned to the ground. Totally unaware of Christ's prediction, Titus ordered the city to be leveled flat. That is, not one stone was left upon another. The temple was completely demolished. According to Jehus, Josephus, 1,100,000 people were killed in the siege. 97,000 were enslaved with their leaders, Simon Bargiora and John Giscali, who were taken to Rome and slain. You know, it's uh, also written in the, in the records that um, as they returned to Rome, General Titus in the procession, the victory procession, they offered to give him a wreath of victory, and he, he refused to receive the wreath of victory. And his comment was, a wreath? A wreath of victory. His comment was that uh, there was no point in, um, in receiving a wreath of victory because there's no, uh, there's no, there's no, um, there's no true victory in uh, defeating a people who have been deserted by their own God. The victory parade that uh, arrived at Rome included all the soldiers, all the slaves, and all the wealth taken from Jerusalem. <coughs> the wealth taken from Jerusalem included um, the seven lamp candlesticks, um, the um, gold and the silver, and um, the, the Bible that is um, the Pentateuch that was in the most holy place. Jerusalem was leveled like a, like a field. That's the story of the horror that took place in Jerusalem. Time to look at our reformer of the night. And his name is John Calvin. Who was John Calvin? John Calvin was a French theologian. He was a pastor and a reformer in Geneva during the Protestant Revolution. He was born on the 10th of July, 1509, in Noyon, France. He died on the 27th of May, 1564, in Geneva, Switzerland. What was he best known for? John Calvin. John Calvin is known for his influential book called The Institutes of Christian religion, which was published in 1536. The book uh, called Institutes of Christian Religion contains the ideas on the Bible as a source of truth. However, it contains some uh, writings on predestination as well, which, is a lot, which uh, gives rise to a lot of controversy and disagreement in uh, these modern days. It also writes about salvation, and as the teaching of Calvin, which is known as Calvinism. Secondly, second point, the first, he was the first systematic theological um, tre treatise of the reform movement, also contained in his book. And Calvin was best known for stressing the doctrine of predestination and his interpretation of Christian teaching. Do we 
Do we know what predestination is? You are predestined to salvation. Okay, we'll go through that. What is Calvinism? It's also called the Reformed tradition, Reformed Protestantism, Reformed Christianity, or simply Reformed. There's a major branch of Protestantism that follows the theological tradition and forms of Christian practice set down by John Calvin. It emphasizes the sovereignty of God and the authority of the Bible. But Calvinism, is something wrong with Calvinism? Are there some controversies arising out of Calvinism today? One, five points there. It um, talks about, it uh, holds the doctrine of total depravity. What is total depravity? It is only when one finally rejects God. Uh, for us in um, today, according to the Bible, when the spirit is withdrawn from someone, then he sort of experiences or goes through total depravity. Next, unconditional election. For those that are elected to be saved into the kingdom, they have been predetermined, centered and conditioned upon Christ and have been having faith in him. That means, you agree with that? Or do you have to make a choice? choice. You have to make a choice. Mm. All right? Okay, third point. Unlimited atonement. Uh, sorry, limited atonement. Limited atonement. Christ atonement is limited to some only. What does the scripture say? It is unlimited. The atonement is unlimited. It's for everybody. Unlimited atonement. But in Calvinism, there is uh, this doctrine of uh, limited atonement. Fourth, irresistible grace. Men can resist God and fall from grace. Do we agree with that? Mm. Yes. Perseverance, uh, pers perseverance of the saints. Perseverance of saints simply means some believer, some believers, they can apostatize, fall away from the faith, but some the saints need to persevere and go forward. Do we agree with that? Mm -hmm. And the Bible text that they use to, to, um, to support this doctrine. Now, let me ask, for you and I, do we reject them completely? Calvinism? For they are Protestants. And they are the reform, part of the reform movement. We must be very careful because we came out of them. Amen? The Seventh-day Adventist movement came out of all these Protestant movements that took place at the end of the Dark Ages. And we, we came out of the, at the end when light had broken upon the earth. Continuing on, what is Calvinism? It is the theological system of John Calvin and his followers characterized by the Emph uh, emphasis on the doctrines of predestination. Predestination means we don't make a choice. We have been chosen beforehand. The irresistibly ability of grace and the justification by faith. The gospel says Jesus came to save the world. Calvinism teaches Jesus came to save the elect. Amen? There are slight differences. The gospel says Jesus died for all men. Calvinism teaches Jesus died for only the elect. That's limited atonement. Amen? Some of these uh, errors were found in early reformers. And we must understand and uh, accept this. Because those early reformers, they had part of the truth. And they lived according to the truth they received and died for it. Can we, can we begin from this day? Can we look back and condemn them? No, no we can't. 
because we have received all of our life. How much do we stand and live according to all of our life we have received? You see? Comparing them like that with us and from that point, that standpoint, we cannot condemn them. We look at the errors that were there, which they were not able to see, and we learn from that, from those errors, and see how much light we have and how we are living according to the light we have received. The gospel says Jesus, God's freedom plan is Jesus as a ransom for men and all who believe are saved. Salvation teaches choose some for salvation, send Jesus and died for them, and cause them to believe. Limited atonement and predestination. And so forth. But what I'm trying to say, the reformers, as we have been looking at in the past nights, are not all free of errors. Some reformers still had some errors in their teaching, which they did not know at that time. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord mm -hmm. for the right that we have today. Yeah? Yeah. Continuing on. Calvinists or Reformed or Protestants and so forth. Calvinists broke from the Roman Catholic Church in the 16th century. Calvinists differ from Lutherans on the spiritual, real presence of Christ mm -hmm. in the Lord's Supper. When it comes to the Lord's Supper, what the Lutheran believes and what the Calvinist believes are different. Mm -hmm. What do you believe regarding the Lord's Supper? You see that? We have to see and uh, find out to ourselves what do we believe in? We know that Luther believes this about the Lord's Supper. We know that Calvinists believe this about the Lord's Supper. What do we believe about the Lord's Supper? We do this four times a year. What do we believe about it? Can we can we um, explain it? Can we speak this faith that we have? Our beliefs? So moving on, different in theories of worship. They are different in theories of worship. Different in purpose and meaning of baptism. Different in the use of God's law for believers. Right. The tulip. The tulip. All of the five, the five points that we were talking about. T stands for total depravity. That means when the Holy Spirit is withdrawn for a person from someone, that person is totally depraved. We believe that too. Unconditional election. That's you. L limited atonement. And P uh, I sorry irresistible grace. And P Perseverance of the saints. The five point um, beliefs of the Calvinists. The movement was first called Calvinism in the 1550s by Lutherans. Lutherans and Calvinists, they were sometimes at loggerheads and against each other. We'll come to our beliefs of the Lord's Supper eh, shortly, okay? Calvinist important re reformers. The movement was first called Calvinism in the early 1550s by the Lutherans who opposed them. Many in the tradition find it either a nondescript or inappropriate term, and they prefer to be called reform. Calvin is an important ref Reformation theologian. We've, we've uh, studied uh, many of the reformers in the three previous nights, and just to name a few more, we have Zwingli, Martin Butcher, William Farrell, Henry Bullinger, Peter Martin, Theodore Beza, and John Mark. Now back to Calvin and his last years. The last 10 years of Calvin's life was quiet and productive. Magnum Opus, the book that he wrote, which is the Institutes of Christian Religion, was published in 1559, and he continued his lectures on the Lamentations, which was continued, concluded in 1563. Another book he wrote, 
sermons on uh, first and second Samuel was completed in 1563. In the summer of 1563, Calvin's health began to rapidly decline. Steady stream, a steady stream of eager visitors continued to flow into his house, as was the case when he was still uh, healthy and walking about. They came from Geneva. They came from all of Europe, even from all over the world. However, in 1564, that, um, that year, on Easter, Luther, uh, sorry, Calvin attended the Lord's Supper in church, but he had to be carried there in a chair. So he was really uh, losing his strength and uh, his life was ebbing away. Calvin's natural death. In April 1564, confined to, he was confined to a sick bed and uh, remained there for an extended period of time. But he continued to deliver exhortations from his sick bed to ministers from around the country. In, on May 27, 1564, following month, he died in his sick bed. But his close, close friend was in attendance. He was with him. His close friend's name was Theodore Beza. In Theodore Beza's words, describing Calvin, he said, we can truly say that in this one man, God has been pleased to demonstrate to us the way to live well and to die well. <laughs> Calvin was wrapped in a simple shroud. He was placed in a, in a simple, undecorated casket, and he was buried in an unmarked grave. But the cemetery was called Plain Palais. What's the meaning of Plain Palais? Plain, plain Palace. Plain Palace, eh? Yeah, plain palace. What's the point in, um, in uh, being buried like this, in a nondescript uh, grave, unmarked? Is there a point in that? The point is, as this man lived, it's the way he died. When he was alive, he was always making sure that no one, that he was not pointing at himself, but he was pointing people away from himself, pointing people to God. Amen. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Final testament of John Calvin. This is his final testament. In his words, Alas, my desires and my zeal, if I may so describe it, have been so cold and flagging that I am conscious of imperfections in all that I am and do. Throughout his life, he continued to see himself as a, as a weak, fallen, um, wretched, uh, wretched man with imperfections. In life, Calvin was bold in defense of truth. He was incessant in preaching and lecturing, in writing and editing to further the gospel in clarity. He was indefatigable and his literary output was extraordinary. Let's, finally, this is what he said. He wrote, his greatest priority was never to point to himself, but to Christ as his great redeemer. And that's why he wrote this down. But God does not bestow the honorable title of his children on any but those who acknowledge that they are strangers on the earth and who not only are at all times prepared to live it, but likewise to move forward in an uninterrupted course towards the heavenly life. Amen? Amen. Those words, brothers and sisters, are Seventh-day Adventist words. True or false? Those are biblical words. God does not bestow the honorable title of his children on any but those who acknowledge that they are strangers on this earth. Amen. We have no ties 
that hold us on to this earth. We are free and we are moving. Strangers on this place going to our home in heaven. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. The question again we will pose one more time before we close. Is the protest over? Is the protest over? No, the protest is not over. Will you be a protestant? In Jesus' name.